Well, at first, I just wanted to uh, introduce everybody today on our panel. Um, we are, uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover, and this is very exciting. Three very different uh, productions, and so I'm sure we're going to have a lot to talk about. Um, starting with uh, five days uh, at Memorial with Madonna Wade Reed. And uh, if you would just like to introduce yourself and uh, you. is this tell the audience a little bit about, uh, about what brought you here. Um, okay, so uh, Five Days in Memorial uh, began as a book written by a New York Times uh, journalist that was based on the first five days in New Orleans after Katrina in 2005. Uh, really brutal time, really difficult story to tell, and uh, if you follow it at, it at all in the news, you know that there were some questionable choices and decisions made at a hospital. So the series covers the first five days and then the uh, investigations that took place afterwards that exposed that, um, sadly, patients had been uh, gently helped uh, to pass away because the hospital was not able to take care of everyone. Uh, in the spirit of uh, most of the projects that I do with John Ridley, I needed a little bit of therapy after. <laughs> um, really, really difficult and brutal story to tell. And I think um, today I'm going to talk about the main title, which for me was the muse for the series, the sound for the series, the ethos of what happened. Um, and really kicked off a, not a particularly music-heavy series, but a series where when you're making choices and telling difficult stories, you have to choose really, really carefully. Thank you. And it's, it's an amazing uh, opening title song for that production. Uh, next, we have Luck, which is an animated uh, film, G rating. Uh, and Julianne Jordan, would you like to introduce... You're sure. Sorry. Well, ours is completely different from Madonna's. <laughs> now Very for different. something completely different. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, Luck is an animated film. Um, the first animated film from Skydance Animation. And um, it, uh, Julie and I were actually, uh, we started on the project, we, we were on the project for about four years. Yeah. So we, we started, you know, very early on this, which, which we really like to do on films. Um, we also started very early on this other film, Trolls, and we feel like it's the best way for us to um, be involved in the, the process and make the most impact. Um, and, um, yeah, so female director, director Peggy Holmes, who is amazing to work with, and um, it's a super cute movie. Um, we were also able to work with um, John Lasseter, um, who has come to Skydance Animation, obviously, from, um, from his, Pixar. you know, the, the genius behind Pixar. Um, so, so that was an amazing experience as well. And um, I'll just, I can tell a little yeah. bit about luck it, what the yeah. storyline is. Um, it's really cute. It is rated G and it's, you know, but we love it too. So if you have kids or even if you just want a nice weekend watch, um, it's about, um, how bad luck and good luck work together in your life. Like this girl has her name, her, the main character's name is Sam. And you're going to see a cute little montage. The first montage you're going to see, um, is her chasing this cat. Um, and, uh, she, is just has terrible luck you'll, and you'll see in the montage she says really bad luck and she wants to get find a lucky penny to help a girl it's it's the, the it's based around a theme of foster care her she was came from foster care and anyway without talking too long it's about how you really do need bad luck and good luck in the world for harmony um because a lot of people are like oh i have the worst luck but in this movie you'll see how having the worst luck can bring you the best luck at the end of the day so that's what the story is it's very true and for anybody who doesn't know that, it was Julia Michaels, music supervisor, co-supervisor on Luck. Um, and then moving on to Loot, which is uh, a hoot. Kind of <laughs> also very different very than the other two. <laughs> satirical comedy, uh, very different from the rest. Um, Carrie Druden, would you like to start off, introduce yourself? Sure. And 
Hi, I'm, yeah. Hi. <laughs> I'm Carrie Druton. Um, I'm an in-house music supervisor at NBC Universal, along with Charlie. We work on lots Hello. of shows together. Um, and yeah, we were brought on to loot kind of at the last minute, but um, we got it done fast and furiously. And it's just a super fun show starring Maya Rudolph, who's like a billionaire who goes through a divorce right away. And is, it's kind of just searching for the meaning of life and what to do with all her money. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a comedic take on the, the Jeff Bezos or any sort of billionaire divorce story of they were married young, they had no prenup, when they get, he cheats on her, they get divorced and she gets half of his wealth and decides to get into philanthropy. Um, and uh, it's a, you know, at the end of the day, it's a very heartwarming story, but it's also extremely irreverent and, and funny. Uh, we were brought on at the last minute, like Carrie said. Um, they had, they're sort of going in a more like yacht rock uh, 70s vibe uh, throughout production. We were on as the clearance people and they had, uh, Zach Cowie was the music supervisor. Um, and then as it shifted, once they got into post and they decided they want to go in more of a, uh, a 90s hip hop bad boy era direction that just wasn't, you know, Zach's uh, universe. Yeah. And it's Carrie's universe for sure. Yeah. And, and, you know, mine a little bit as well. So, Zach stepped down. They asked if we want to take over creatively, and, and it was a, a mile was, a minute from there. Yeah, we had we had about two months to do the whole project. Normally, we have you know anywhere from six to nine. Um, so it was sometimes in, two years. Yeah, sometimes two years, <laughs> and it was a lot. I mean, if you've seen it, um, because of the shift in musical style, we also um, lost our composers. So luckily, we had a healthy music budget, and we loaded it up with really fun late 90s, early 2Ks hip hop, a lot of bad boy style. But I mean, if you hear it, you know, we have Mariah Carey running through it. It's it's a lot of fun, expensive music and like a kind of fun, expensive show. So yeah, it's... we had a blast and, and we brought on um, the math club and DJ Cheap Shot to do the main title theme, which was amazing. And they did some stuff throughout and uh, it all came together really great. We're really proud of it. And it's from Alan Yang and Matt Hubbard. Um, who's been, Alan Yang's been on Master of None, Little America, Parks and Rec. If memory serves correct, my memory sucks. He wrote the rap mouse songs in Parks and Rec. Yeah. So there's a tidbit. <laughs> and uh, Matt Hubbard, Hubbard was the, like, head writer on 30 Rock and a bunch of our other great shows. So it, it, it was a great crew and a lot of fun. Yeah. I wanted to ask each of you about, you know, what it's like to jump into a production like this as far as... Um, Getting your workflow. I mean, what do, what do you need to do on the episodic series or in a film? Are you in scoring sessions? Are you spotting things? Um, you know, how much input are you getting from the writers and the directors, um, you know, for you to be able to do your job as a music supervisor? So um, why don't we just start with, with you two here on uh, Loot? Yeah, for sure. Um... I think, you know, again, like we mentioned, since we came on rather late and there was a change in direction, uh, Matt and Alan really knew what they wanted to do. And just sort of, we, we had a meeting with, with them and uh, one of the main editors, Daniel, who Carrie goes back with as well. So it kind of made the, the workflow more seamless. Um, and really just spitballed ideas, listened to them. Uh, they gave us, you know, certain keywords and certain artists and certain... Um, vibes that they wanted to capture, and then we were kind of just off to the races from there. I mean, yeah, I mean, and also one of their big points, which I thought was cool, is that you know this show is about money, but they didn't want songs that were just money, money, money necessarily, but wanted to feel kind of rich and expensive without like being so on the nose. Um, so yeah, we just jumped in and started grabbing and just so many songs from that era that we thought could work and. They're just great to work with. They're music guys. Our lead editor, Dan, I used to play shows with him. Our bands were buddies. We go back like 20 years. So I know that he has a good ear. He used to record my band. He's, so it's fun to like link back up with him. And, and the editors were awesome at making things work. And then we were just constantly throwing music. But um, yeah, we were in deep on that one. It was super fun. I mean, we had, it's, it's wall to wall expensive songs pretty much which and is it, it's kind of a luxury too i mean like we work at nbc it's not always like that on our shows so it, it was fun to have yeah i would say for one but for one episode we had the budget that uh, you know a lot of times that's what i have for an entire season um that helps. it was a, so it was yeah it was a fun sandbox to play in you know we, we already had a healthy budget 
Um, and they they kind of front loaded the episodes to see, you know, to come out strong. And Apple saw the 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 first episodes, and we were hoping we could just sort of the first two go go out strong, and then kind of take it down from there. And they gave us even more and said, "Keep it going." So yeah, and that's when they're like, so we also like there's a lot of really recognizable instrumentals that are used for ten seconds, and but we didn't have a composer anymore, so we kind of had to make it work really quickly. Um, but also, which is great, but also, I mean, if you know anything about clearances and licensing, these aren't the easiest songs to clear. These aren't the quickest songs to clear. And, you know, multiple publishers, writers, I, I almost drove across town to try to find a widow <laughs> of some jazz sample that like had an address probably from 20 years ago. Like I was like, that's it. I found an address. I'm sure. Yeah. I, you know, and we, we had a blast doing this, but there was still sleepless nights of, you know, is this song going to clear in time? We're pushing mixed deliveries, pushing things as much as we could to make the songs work. And I'd say 98% of it worked out. There were a couple we had to pull at the last minute, but. Yeah. yeah. And they kept holding mixes open for us, which was like, we're like, just move on. And they're like, no, we're not moving on. We want that one song. Um, yeah. And then towards the end of the season, we got into a, bunch, a couple of French um heavy episodes with like yay yay music and I love that stuff so we had, we had a blast with that too so it's kind of fun to take a break for a couple episodes from all of the hip hop and, and kind of go fun French music. Yeah it was just a good collaborative you know open conversation they definitely led the the charge and had their directives but then gave us a fun sandbox to play in. Yeah and DJ Cheap Shot we brought him on to do the main title theme and do some interstitials and he Killed it. If you guys haven't seen the main title theme, I've watched it like a hundred times because I love it. It's, <laughs> the song is great. Um, the song it's was great. in there and Apple didn't realize it was something we had created. And they're like, what is this? We don't know what this is yet. We don't know what this is yet. We're like, it yeah, was made by it. the show. It sounds like a real songy song. But it's, it, it's awesome. It is a real song. It's great. So he killed yeah. it. He made us look good. And yeah. Voila, worked out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's very very driven by commercial tracks and, and yes, very 100%. little score. Um, yeah. uh, in episode one, um, I saw that there were about five or six like super heavy hitting tracks yeah. in there, and uh, that's a lot. Did you have any trouble like you know I, artists like Puff Daddy and yeah. you know things like that with, <laughs> with clearances? I mean, was any did you get pushback? Were there challenges? Um, I think the biggest pushback we got is, are you sure you can afford this? And fortunately, we could say yes every time. We just need it done quickly, like, you know, to clear it tonight. Um, we need which, a lot of loot for yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And, and a lot of things took time. Like, um, the songs ultimately cleared, but it was by the skin of our teeth often, especially yeah. with the Puff Daddy camp. And putting all the samples together and putting, get, tracking down all the publishing and making sure everyone was aware, because, you know, these are songs that had been, a lot of them hadn't been cleared in 10, 15 years. So as music supervisors, do you find that to be more stressful than a, a show that may be more driven by a composer where you just know, like, at the end of the day, we're going to be getting our revisions in? Uh, you know, is, is that keeping you up at night saying, hey, we, we're, we're days away from finalizing this and we still don't have clearance on a huge scene? It does, but we do this so often that, I mean, this was particularly loaded in that way, but it, it's... There were so many songs we had to push through for clearance every week. But. Yeah, you kind of just get used to the stress. Um, <laughs> and it, it's, it's a lifestyle, Charlie. A lifestyle. Yeah, exactly. That's what I always exactly. say. It's a lifestyle for all you people out there, right? You guys know. Be careful what you're getting into. Yeah. The longer you do it, the less sleep you lose. Yeah, and yeah at the exactly. At the end of the day, it's music and a TV that's show, true. right? It's, it's either going to happen or it's not, and yeah. it'll be fine. And that's yeah. what I tell myself when I'm losing my mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But it all worked out. Um, the opening sequence, there was another song in there for a while that is usually clearable, um, and it was just caught up in, like, some legal complication, and we couldn't get it, but we yeah. released it with something equally awesome. Maybe yeah, yeah, it was... Um I forget what the first one was, but it had a Bowie sample, and the, the Bowie rights were changing hands at the time. Uh, yeah, right. And so it was it was all, you know, everyone was aware of what was going on, but we just couldn't get the you know somebody to say yes and sign off on it. So we found a Mace song, Feel So Good, and the show actually fell so in love fun. with that, and it, it worked even better. Um, but we still kept pushing on the first song because I wanted to make that work. We did make it work at the last minute. But and then they kept Mace. Yeah, and then they kept Mace <laughs> in. So. It was meant to be. It was yeah, exactly. To be. Yeah. Totally. Now for season two, we just have to find more clearable songs we haven't used yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Y'all have any. <laughs>
let us know. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's shift gears to to luck for a moment. Um, very score driven. Yeah. Working with the legend uh, John Debney. Yeah. Uh, how is that? Is that more challenging working with somebody of that status, or is it? Uh, are they set in their ways? Do you need to, you know? cater to them more than you would to yeah. else, or is it, is it I would say no with John no he <laughs> John. is he is so malleable in the best way and just so open to I mean so collaborative with with any director I've worked with him multiple times um, throughout the years and he is just he's he's in it he's fully engaged he's just you know, willing to make any any change um, with you know, still obviously keeping his artistic integrity, and um, you know, just just watching this clip reminded me of how it's kind of rare to have movies like this now. Where I mean, like every every there's so much score in this film, and every beat is is scored, and so it's sort of the more like traditional way that movie, movies used to be like just just so, especially with animation like just score like just just hitting every note and it's that's why I think this movie is kind of refreshing in that way that it's a, you know very traditionally beautiful beautiful themes um and and our director like you know she wanted that and and she had John Debney in mind for um for for a very long time mm -hmm. to to work on this film and they ended up having you know a great relationship but um i i think that that this is this is kind of a rare thing and and i hope that um that's why you know people are are watching this because it is it's more you know traditional animation traditional family fair yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, what Julian's touching on, if you guys watch that closely, every nuance is scored, like, you know, the cat when he blinks and then when he goes down the trees. And even at the beginning, and you haven't seen it as much as we have, but there's Irish instruments in there because it's about luck, right? So he's, he's layered that in nicely, but it still feels contemporary. Um, so the whole score is beautiful. It's out on Spotify if you guys want to listen to it, but John's a love. Um, but just to touch more on what Kevin was uh, asking is, you know, Julian and I do a lot of musical films, like a lot of song driven, a lot of music films. And this isn't any easier, um, except the nice thing about animation is, you know, there it's longer, right? So there's longer times. But when you have someone like John, where the work is flowing, you know, they're, it kind of runs itself, but we are in, you know, every spotting session and every listening session. This, of course, was on Zoom because it was in a pandemic. We, we, everybody here probably knows now what Evercast is. We learned how to finish all our movies yeah. on Evercast. We were lucky, though, towards the end, we were able to do in-person yeah. meetings because COVID was kind of, and that was just amazing. We did fly to Skywalker yeah. and we got to uh, do our final playback up there. But most of it was done in in in, uh, in lockdown. So, you know, the back and forth with um, our director, of course, is how we did this. And then ultimately, when she signed off, it went to John Lasseter. And then we would have a Zoom with John. And he's a genius, you know, listening to him and his mind and his storytelling. And one thing that really touched me that he said, which if you guys think about all the movies he's done, Cars and... Toy Story, as he said, when he makes a movie and he creates a theme for a score, he wants the people to want to go to that place. So, like, they they wind up going to somewhere called the Land of Luck. And we did not show that clip, but he's like, he wanted that theme to be where I want people to go, want to go to the Land of Luck when they walk out of this movie. And so that was a really cool <laughs> thing in your mind. I mean, we all want to go to the Land of Luck, but, you know, it was just really kind of cool to think about. And John was thinking about when he was writing the score. And we did, he did that luck theme quite, uh, you know, a few incarnations. But um, we'll talk about, there was a song in it, but just the process of doing the score with John was was wonderful. I, I did hear a lot of like Irish overtones in the score and, and I did appreciate that Land of Luck was run pretty much by the Irish. So uh, I thought that <laughs> there was- There you go, that Kevin Houlihan. But- uh, <laughs> Can't fight it, you can't fight it. <laughs> yeah. 
but I am I'm truly excited for um, this film. I, you know, as a father of uh, six and seven year old girls, I, I can pretty much assure you I'll watch it at least a hundred times. Yeah. So yes, you will. Yes, you will. That every stream it, stream is, it, Apple. Uh, every scene looks like it's brilliant and I'm, I'm very much anticipating it. Um, Madonna, let's uh, go to you real quick on, on the show. So, you know, this is a bit more, uh, Thriller-esque, it's a drama, it's uh, Debbie dark. Downer yeah, at this end. <laughs> uh, there's a lot going on, For but every the luck you have really to have. does, um, you know, enhance each scene. Uh, you know, I was, I was on the edge of my seat when I was watching, uh, watching a few of the episodes, and um, how, how does that go for you when you're, when you're working? I mean, do you ever find that, like, things can be too dark or too weird? Do you have to lighten it up sometimes, or? Uh, well... I mean, as I said, I, I work a lot with John Ridley, and his choices are not normally bubbly and happy. Um, so I'm usually pretty prepared for what I'm in store for that, you know, I'm going to need a break after. Um, and certainly with this story, that there's not really any light moments in it. Um, but he, I, I will tell you, the process of working with him is really unique. We have an incredible shorthand. And he is one of the uh, creators who never tells me what he wants. He hands, he'll breadcrumb me some stuff. Sometimes he'll be like, can you pull some songs by? And he'll give me like three clues. He won't tell me what the story is. He won't tell me anything. He just wants to see what I'll come up with. And then he'll breadcrumb me something else. And then in the case of this, he sent me the script, and he did what he always does, which is he sends me a script, and then he goes, call me after and tell me what you wanted to. And he never he never tells me what he wants. He never, he, he's just buttoned up about it. And the running joke is I call him, and I go, let me tell you what I'm not going to do. I hate to tell him what I'm going to do. I always tell him <laughs> what I'm not going to do. And it usually means that if there's like a, more patented, simple way to do it, then that's not the way I'm going to do it. Um, and so for this one, when it came time to tell him what I wasn't going to do, I said, I'm, I'm not altogether sure, I said, but what's resonating with me is, you know, there is a period of time in New Orleans when there is no power. So technically, you can't play music. So there's not going to be music playing in the background of things once the power is gone. And I'm going to look really dumb just dropping songs in, the, the words on the page are powerful enough that they don't need my help with a song. It's sad enough. It's brutal enough. It's frightening enough. I don't need to put a song under that, and I don't want to. It'll be the wrong choice. So I said to him, I really want to lean into a cappella. And he was kind of like, uh, OK. And I was like, just, just go with me. Go with me. And so I thought to myself, you know, obviously there's probably not going to be a lot of music in the episodes, so the place where I'm going to make the biggest mark is in the main title. And so I'd started to collect some songs and ask people, like, can I have the a cappella version? And I thought to myself, you know, one of the things that was, you know, very apparent about Katrina was there were certain communities that were less rescued, le less looked after, and a lot of that was the black community. So I felt like I really want to lean into a spiritual I really want to lean into the less served community, the people who were not rescued first, all of that. And so I had sent, been sent this version of Wade in the Water by Adrian Gonzalez with the, the top line done by Joanna Jones, who also is known as the Dame, I believe. Um, and I was like, wow, this is kind of amazing. And then I made the same mistake I make on every project with John Ridley. I sent him the song and I said, I just want you to have an idea of like the sound I'm going for. Like, I'm gonna like pull lots of a cappella songs and let's see if like we sprinkle these throughout the series. And then he called me back and he's like, oh great, you found the main title. And I was like, no, 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 no. This is just, we're taking a barometer reading where this is a measuring stick, this is inspiration. He's like, no, no, this is a main title. And can I tell you something? I don't think we ever listened to another song. We never listen to another song. It, it is the perfect song. It is the perfect song. I mean, I sat in my office, and I kid you not, I cried. I had, you know, I had goosebumps. And I just thought, if I can't have a lot of music in the series, 
every time you start to watch the episode, I need to put you where yeah. you need to be. Mm -hmm. And I could only do that with the most haunting, you know, there's a little bit of music in it. It's not completely a cappella, um, but we bookend, we end the series in our end titles with that song. I just thought I have to reset the viewer every episode. Let's remember what happened because we do jump forward to the investigations. We do leave 2005, but I was like, we may leave 2005, but I want you to still feel 2005. And that, my friends, is called passionate music supervision. Yeah. It's amazing. That theme's on while we're talking about uh, opening title songs, why don't we uh, jump into luck? Because I know you have that amazing version of Madonna's Lucky Star. Uh, yeah, and I wish we could. That doesn't sound easy. I wish we could have shown it to you guys. But apparently there's like. Yeah, some legal reason some we couldn't legal. show it. But. Well, I don't know. Uh, you guys can go home and stream it. Um, yeah, so um, we were, yeah, trying to figure out like how to how to start this film. I think we, if I remember, kind of remembering this, um, we sent a whole bunch of songs about luck. Remember, that's yes, the first thing we did. I mean, right. obviously, yeah. that's not like Duh. that's like music supervision one hundred and one. Yeah, like, hey, let's get some songs about luck and you know the yes. Irish, and so we just had massive playlists. <laughs> And if then, anybody wants that list, yeah, we got it. <laughs> we, we got, got it you. for you. Um, and then Peggy chose this song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were there were a few. I think there there were like three that we were thinking about, and yeah. then maybe one didn't. One we couldn't clear, and then a couple other. And this one, you know, Lucky it, a Lady it, was one of them. I don't know them. if you guys have seen the movie, but it, it it's in it's our it's our main title, and it's in the body of the film as well, and. Um, and it is just really, really, really fun. Like to, you know, to have like this fun '80s, '80s vibe song that um, people have not uh, heard heard a lot in films. And it was, it was not easy to clear. It it took a very, very, very long time to clear this song. And we finally, um, with the help of uh, Wendy Christensen at Warner Chapel, who is amazing, rock star. Um, she was, you know, really trying to push it with the Madonna camp, and it just it just took a very long time. And obviously, with animation, like <clears throat> they're waiting because, you know, the song is it's there. You know, she's dancing to the song in the opening. So, um, so it, you know, it's like they're, they're waiting on us, and and so it was kind of that was kind of like a more of a a last minute thing that we were finally able to get it clear. Thank you, Madonna. Oh, thank you. Yeah, but not this one. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, I so. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll send the check that way. Bye. <clears throat> and um, we brought on somebody um, to do the arrangement of this who we've worked with many times, um, a lot of Don Faseca, who's an amazing engineer and producer. She's badass. We did all the Pitch Perfect movies with her, among other things. And she came and did, did a great arrangement. And um, she's kind of like our secret sauce. Um, not so secret anymore. <laughs> um, and um, the, the woman who is the voice of our main character... Um, is Eva, Eva, Eva Noblezada, and she's a Broadway star, and she won the Tony for Hades Town. Um, and she is amazing. And we didn't meet her because, again, we were in lockdown. But um, she was the voice. So she was going to sing it. Obviously, she can sing. So, um, But she fell in love with Alana's vocal. Remember this? She yeah. was like, oh, my God, Alana's vocal is amazing. And so they became really good friends <laughs> close over Zoom. But we went through a lot of incarnations of this song, like you do on every arrangement, new song. And um, Alana, Peggy, the we should mention, the, the director's a choreographer. So there's two moments the song is used. At the very opening, <clears throat> Sam, our main character, is singing Lucky Star. They're kind of playing a little play thing. And the middle of the movie, um, one of the, Bob, the cat, is trying to distract all these bunnies that are working in the Penny Depot. Um, and um, she starts to sing Lucky. She turns them around, and she does this big choreographed number to Lucky Star. So the fun thing was Peggy's a choreographer, so she was doing all the animation choreograph choreography while these arrangements were happening. 
And um, so we turned, we, and she wanted it very 80s. Like it's, it's very like the, you know, like the uh, original. And so what we did is we just recorded Eva, like I'm sure a lot of you have done, uh, um, over Zoom. So she was in New York and we were on Zoom and we set up a studio and we recorded her twice, two different times, and um, her vocals on it and they animated to it and it's super, super cute. Um, it is the only song in the film, but it's a big feature. Uh, so that was a really fun thing because besides the score, we got to work on this. And as Julian said, it was it is involved when you're doing animation because they're really waiting for you to choose because they want to animate and they can't until the song's cleared or at least we know we're going to get it. So it was a little bit stressful. It was a lot stressful, um, tr you know, trying to make our deadlines, but uh, it worked out. So how how was that working with Madonna on the clearance? Like, did she want to see? you know, a version of it, the way that it was going to look in the film, or you obviously couldn't do that without having her approval. Yeah, she did. So she did she didn't even ask for approval. It was kind of like to get her to pay yeah, attention, was, I would it say. It was literally like, yeah, just please, you know, someone who can speak for her, you know, pay attention to this for us. Yeah, I mean, there, there so. was, really was no reason, but it was just, it just, she didn't get to it. But Wendy Christensen called her manager and like it just got to that point where we were like please please but to do our job you know you know we have our people in this audience too that we go to to help us because you know we're, we, we sit for, for nothing to be happening is the worst thing to be happening like we want movement we want conversations happening to know like you're gonna get it or you're not gonna get it are we gonna move on or not so uh, and, and if you yeah. do need our director to send a letter to Madonna, a lot of times that happens too. Like you know, just that extra push. Like we'll just we'll do whatever we have yep. to do. Oh, we've done that many times. So uh, moving over to Loot, you worked with uh, the Math Club for the opening, correct? Um, and did, was that already in place when you when you came out? I know you said things were moving fast already, or was there? that kind of framed out a little bit or did you have no, to not at all when, <laughs> yeah. we, when we got on we still had um composers on board about a week after we got on board they were not on board anymore um so you know we we use so much of their music and 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 we know how how great they are especially at hip-hop and they really specialize in like throwback vibes so we're just like hey what this could be a good fit so they were actually looking the uh matt and alan were looking for like hip hop instrumentals that they could use as score. So we just started throwing them a bunch of their stuff that was pre existing and they really resonated. It really resonated and they're like, we really love this. I'm like, thank God, <laughs> that's great. Um, so we brought them on just to see if we could make some kind of deal to use a bunch of their stuff, but it, it just kept evolving. You know, of course, you're going to need some actual pieces of score here and there. It's not always going to work with pre existing songs. So they ended up getting along great. Then they're like, let's have them do the main title. Let's have them actually create score. Let's also license a bunch of these. So it, it kind of happened very quick and organically, and, and it was just a really great match. Yeah, and um, they already had the visuals for the main title, so the the guys, Cheap Shot and his crew, just sort of wrote to the, the visuals, and they gave them like three or four different options. I think the first one they heard was the one they fell in love with and the one we ended up using. And there was um, no revision. Like, there, was yeah. one revi there was like, they changed one word and they even had just like, um, they were offering to like, hey, we could get a big rapper on this. We have all these connections. And Matt and I were like, we love whoever this is the way it is. It was just like, honestly, it's like never been so easy. It, it was it was awesome. And I'm glad because like we heard it. We're like, this is awesome. Yeah. And then they're like, this is awesome. <laughs> it was <laughs> like, Okay, great. They, they're like, do you want any revisions? They're like, no, just change that money word to some other word. And that was it. It was so smooth. Yeah, it was kind of a dream scenario in that we were just the, the grand connectors of everybody and everyone got along so well and the, the creative vibes were there um, and it was just fun to see it all kind of come together. How is the, um, <clears throat> how's the workflow when you're working as a co-supervisor on a series? Is, um, how do you delegate the work? Does, does somebody do episode one and somebody does episode two? You're working yeah. on the same yeah. thing at the same time? <laughs> all at the same time and like if he has another show flaring up that i'm not on i'll jump in and vice versa which is why it's great to work as a team because we have yeah. so much on our plates that it's like all right my other shows are behaving right now i could jump on this and and we just we just go back and forth a lot of times we'll each put in options for a scene if we if we can um but yeah it's really 
we're on text all day, Charlie and I, especially during lockdown. Now we're back in the office and we could yell yeah. again because <laughs> our, our offices are right next to each other. So. Yeah, it's it's great to you know, like she said, we're just sort of you know as. My schedule lightens up. I'll take things. She'll she'll take over when I get busy. Um, and we also gut check a lot. Like you know, she's an expert on all of this music, uh, mid '90s hip hop for sure. And so I'll have ideas, but I have no idea if it's clearable. And I'm like, have you done this before? And she'll say, This is good. This is good. This is impossible. Don't go down this path. Um, I've worked on a lot of comedies that use hip hop, luckily. Yeah. So. <laughs> How um, many shows are you guys on it? at a time? Like as su- as super, you know, as the well, because we also handle, like, you know, being in-house, we will supervise our own shows and clear our own shows, or sometimes we have independent supervisors and we clear those shows in-house. So between clearance and supervision, I would say between f- five to ten at any given moment. Um, yeah, usually I feel like I have, like, about five at a time, you know, and it ebbs and flows. but And they're all different, right? Different needs, different music? Absolutely, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I tend to work on a lot of our comedies, but I mean, we're also working on Friend of the Family, which is about to come out, which is very much not a comedy. So it's it's fun to also get out of that world sometimes and go into the, these dark places. And we've done so many projects together, too, that we just sort of have a shorthand. Like, I know what she's going to say in this situation, and she knows what <laughs> we I'm We don't know what that's like at all. <laughs> <laughs> totally. We usually show up in the same clothes, but today we didn't. That hasn't happened Seriously. to us yet, unfortunately. <laughs> so. I, I was going to direct the same question to you two, as you have worked on so many projects together. You know, there is a reputation of being the bad girls of acapella. Which, yeah, uh, you know. You know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, does it get easier over the years, or is every project different? Is it? I mean, are there just you just have to face a new set of challenges and you get through it, and you just understand the dynamic of, of working together? How does that go for, the, for Julianne and I? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, yes, of course. I mean, like you guys, we started working together. A little tidbit on Pitch Perfect One, and the ten year anniversary is this week that it came out. Um, which we've been on, so that meant we partnered 12 years ago. Um, that was the first movie we ever started working on together. Um, I won't even go into the whole story, but we were not partners before that. <clears throat> we both been given this movie as an opportunity, and we read the script and went, oh, my God, what the heck is this? Let's partner up. It'll be much easier. Um, so we have, I mean, Julianne and I come from different backgrounds. We kind of finish each other's sentences. Obviously, she's my work wife. But truthfully, when we work together, we try to be on every creative call. Like when our director is calling, like, let me get Julianne or let me get Julia. Like we try to be on every phone call with our filmmakers always together. And if we can't, she'll be like, you take the call. I'll do this. We're always communicating. We don't send search. We don't send any music unless we both approve what we're sending. Like we just have a back and forth flow. And thank goodness it's work because like you said, if something's blowing up with one of Julianne's films, or she wants to go on vacation, then I can jump in and vice versa. And, you know, you know what that's like. You know, nobody wants you to take a vacation on their project. So it just it, it just works for us. I don't know. Yeah. I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is wonderful. Uh, Madonna, you are just the lone wolf here. Uh, I know. I just sit and argue with myself in my office. <laughs> Occasionally, yeah, my husband can will tell come you your in ideas. and I'll be like, what do you think of this? Like, I don't know. <laughs> what do you know? Um, no, I mean, I, I, you know, I've worked both as, you know, together with people, and I've also worked a lot on my own. And I think certainly, uh, I, you know, TMI, I, I'm a parent, and while my kid was at home, I wanted su- a super amount of flexibility and that meant by just working for myself, by myself, meant that I could work the bake sale at 2 o'clock if I wanted, and I didn't have to check with anyone. Um, and once my kid left home, I sort of had hit a rhythm. And, you know, I am very, very much like yourselves, very collaborative with my with my content creators and my um, showrunners. So I often, you know, bounce ideas off them. So I don't waste time going down a road that um, is endless and will not be fruitful. Um, and I, you know, I don't, I'm, I think I'm a loner at heart. And I also can go down rabbit holes. And I don't think I need to drag anyone down them with me. <laughs> um, when, I, 
when I get into something like acapella. I don't want to tell you how many days I worked on that before I sent over the one song as an idea. Um, but so, and it works for me and, uh, you know, the world has changed and allowed us all to uh, work remotely. And I dare anybody to tell me that I have to be in the room anymore if I don't want to be. So I do take vacations. I may work on them, but uh, I don't have to, you know, worry anybody else about how I'm doing it when I'm doing it. Awesome. Well, I have a million more questions for all of you. This has been super interesting. I just got the two minute warning about two minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> which means uh, our 10-minute Q&A uh, is most likely not going to happen, unless anybody has a very strong question they would like to ask. Can we squeeze one in? Just one quick question. Sorry. Um, I'm uh, Anthony. I'm here with the Hope 77 Music. I just had a question from a Donna real quick, because first off, what an incredible opening sequence, what an incredible rendition of that song. And I had two quick questions. First off, in a world where there are a million versions of that song, how did you settle on that one particular version? And then second, was there anything, was it simpler or more difficult to clear a track like that where I have to imagine a lyric will probably cover the name at this point, right? But each version obviously has its own copyright thing and all those. So can you talk about that for a second? Yeah, I mean, Adrian Gonzalez is an effing genius. And we have an incredible relationship where she sends me stuff sometimes very early, you know, asks me what I'm thinking about, what I'm working on, and, you know, it was part of some songs that she had sent me, and I was like, are there a cappella versions of this? I had already started leaning into research about spirituals. There's, in episode four, um, one of the characters sings a spiritual to her mother in her hospital bed, so I sort of knew that was coming up, and I thought, okay, I'm on the right track, but she sent that to me, and I, you know, very professionally, made a choice based on goosebumps. Yeah. It's a really yeah. Best you know, choice serious, ever. technical Great choice. Um, no process that I yeah. use sometimes choosing music. And so I was fortunate enough that she had sent it to me at the time. I think it hadn't, it, you know, she had created it with Joanna. It had not been licensed. And um, we literally, I was like, please do not let anyone else have this. And we bought it out from her. It took a long time, but... Um, yeah, you just, you you know, I, luck, I got lucky that I had a good, strong relationship with a producer-songwriter, and because of that, uh, something landed in my lap, and the stars and the moon aligned, and it was the perfect song. Thank you. That, that is a great yeah. note to end on. Uh, I want to thank everybody on this panel today for your time and your insight. That was incredible. And the Guild of Music Supervisors, um, Apple, for uh, thank sponsoring you, Apple. this. Thank you, Apple. And um, thank you all. Yeah, for thanks coming for coming. And, thanks for uh, sitting thanks. and listening. Yeah. Hope you had a great thanks, time. Guys. We'll thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>